Good morning, everyone, assuming that it's morning when you're watching this, and we want to welcome all of you wherever you happen to be as we gather together for our service today in this time of praise and learning from God's Word and all the things that He would have in store for us. And, and of course, the beauty of this is that uh, we are the church no matter what that looks like, whether we're gathered together in a building or whether we're in our separate homes or wherever we happen to be watching this. Uh, because of the things that God has done and because of who he is, um, we as a church continue to thrive and exist, and we are grateful for that and grateful to God for that. And I do want to take an opportunity to thank um, all those on the worship team over the last number of weeks that have helped in so many different ways um, in putting together these different services, whether it's been in the sanctuary, here in this room, or um, with the stuff that George has been doing in his home, um, and just the, the incredible work that he's been doing there for us. And so we are grateful for that and look forward to continuing to serve everyone and to be able to worship together. And so we want to jump right in this morning and offer this song to God, singing wherever you may happen to be about the redemption that God has brought to us. Let's offer this to him. led me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of living water, turned my bitter into sweet, all my burdens are lifted, took the shackles off my feet, and there's no sound louder than a captive set free, so let the redeemed of the Lord say so. His promises evermore. Pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. There is joy in the morning, springing up in my soul. There is life with living. sound louder than the captive set free. No, there's no sound louder than the captive set free. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of His promises encouraging you for a while now to spend some time in the devotions that we've been putting out each week for the past number of weeks. And once again, you'll find those there on the email that has the link to this service, as well as on the YouTube page. And we encourage you to go to those, use those, um, spend some time in God's Word and, and be in God's presence. And we're doing that each week because we have this incredibly unique God. And He's unique because this is a God that chooses to invite us into his presence. And when we come into the presence of God, there's so many things that we can bring before him. We might bring our requests, um, our confessions, 
Uh, we might bring our praises um, or even our laments. But the truth is, when we're in God's presence, we don't actually have to bring any of that. See, one of the gifts is when we come in and spend time in the presence of God, is that he uses that time. And he takes the opportunity to remind us that we belong to him, um, that he loves us as his children, and that he, if we trust him, really is more than enough. And when we spend time in solitude and silence with him, um, those are the things that we're allowed to experience and know when we're in his presence. And so I wanted to do something a little bit different today and introduce you to a song. Uh, this is a song that speaks to those very truths. And Claudia Cameron, one of the people in our community here, she's the one that first introduced me to this song. And it really moved her because it communicated just those simple truths about being in God's presence. And so my hope is that you would listen um, that you would carry these thoughts with you throughout the week, and that it might encourage you to open up those devotions, to spend some time being in God's presence. This is a song called Nothing Else. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me more than anything that you can do I just want you And I'm sorry When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never
never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you Amen Good morning, church. Uh, we're going to do as we have been doing and receive our offering. So we have a family that has prepared to celebrate that for us. Take a look. All right, we are the Coke family, and this is how we celebrate offering. <laughs> All right, another clever use of whipped cream. So there's a theme going on there. I uh, love doing this with you guys. I love uh, celebrating, and I love getting the opportunity to see some familiar faces from our community as we spend some time apart from one another. So uh, we're going to keep it up. If you would, pray with me. We will receive our offering this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for blessing us. God, thank you for sustaining us. God, for keeping us uh, in your mind and in your heart, um, even in, in lean times, Father. Uh, God, we, we know that you've given us enough. Um, God, that you promised to, uh, to provide. And so, Lord, it's from that uh, knowledge, that understanding, that we come prepared to give back to you. Father, give us uh, grateful hearts. God, give us generous hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as usual, a couple ways to give. Uh, first of all, you can go to our website and uh, click on the Give tab at ccgo.org and then click Give, uh, and you can give there. Uh, the other way to give is via text. You can text the word GIVE to 805-529-5650. And then finally, you can uh, mail in your offering if you'd like to do that. You can mail it into the address that appears on the screen right now, and we can receive it that way. Uh, as you guys are doing that, a few announcements for you. Uh, first, we've been mentioning this for the past few weeks, but we're still uh, taking a lot of prayer requests here. So if you have some things that you'd like to be, uh, to be prayed for, uh, please do send those to us. You can email them to ccto at ccto.org. And we have a group of people that meets every Monday night to pray over these requests. So please keep them coming in. We love the opportunity to pray for our community um, as time goes on. So please do keep that going. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, we have weekly devotions that are coming out. Uh, we have three a week, and they're always linked to the bottom of the YouTube video here. So if you scroll down on your YouTube page, uh, you can see that there's a link. Uh, it also comes out in the Sunday morning emails, so check that as well. Uh, you can download the PDF, and you can follow us along in our devotions this week. Additionally, this week, uh, we're collecting art supplies for uh, foster homes. So uh, you may have received an email about this this week, but if you didn't, uh, scroll down a little bit, and next to that link uh, for the devotions there, there's another link that you can click to download some information about that, including uh, the times that we'll be collecting those items and, uh, and the items uh, that we need themselves. So uh, we're going to be collecting those here at the church on Monday and Wednesday. Click the link below for more information, including time and, uh, and what it is that we're looking for. Uh, with all that out of the way, we're going to go ahead and prepare our hearts to receive communion. So this morning, Marty introduced us to a song uh, called Nothing Else, and a couple of the lines in the song uh, say, th say things along, along the lines of, I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. Uh, I'm sorry when I've just sang another song. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. Uh, I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. And we sing those words uh, from sincere hearts, but we also sing those words with the knowledge that we serve a God who knows entirely that we have come to him with, with improper motives in the past, that we continue to come to him with improper motives, and we will continue to come to him with improper motives. And we serve a God who, knowing that, continues to offer himself for us. Because God's favor for us, God's sacrifice for us, his grace and compassion for us, is in no way connected to our acts of generosity to him, to our purity of heart, to our sense of uh, religiosity. It is entirely an act of grace. It is entirely given to us freely by no merit of our own. And it is that which we celebrate when we receive communion, that God has given of himself. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
so that we need not look at ourselves and say, I have to make myself the best, I have to make myself worthy, I have to make myself capable. Instead, we look at ourselves and say, Lord, I may never be any of those things, and yet you love me. What an amazing gift for us to celebrate as we receive communion this morning, that God sees us as we are, he knows our imperfections, and he still chooses to give of himself for us. Would we celebrate that as we receive communion this morning? Pray with me. Father in heaven, you are so good. Father, not because, not because you give to us when we are worthy, God, not because you give to us when, when we do good things or when we, when we pray enough or when we read enough scripture or when we spend enough time uh, meditating on your word, Lord. Father, but, but you are good to us because you give to us precisely when we do not do those things. Father, when, when we come up short on our spiritual um, efforts, Lord, when, when, we, when we fail to follow through on our commitments, Lord, when we come to you seeking our own uh, gratification, Lord, it is to those broken and, and incomplete people that you offer yourself completely. And that is why we call you good, Father. Lord, would you meet us in this time of receiving communion? Lord, so that we might experience the grace and the mercy of a Father who is so good to love us when we least deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, we're going to see what happens in the life of Jacob. And it's the story of Jacob in a wrestling match with an angel of the Lord. And it's a desperate struggle that we find him in. But to appreciate the wrestling match and the struggle that takes place there and the desperation that Jacob was in, under, we need some context. And so I want to do that for the beginning part of this message. Now, the first thing you need to know about Jacob is that Jacob was not a wrestler. He was not a fighter. Jacob really was a runner. Jacob doesn't fight. He, he flees. So Isaac and Rachel, that's Jacob's parents. They have these twin boys. You've probably heard of them before. Jacob and his older brother Esau. Now Esau, of course, is only older by just minutes. But because he's older, he has the blessing that comes with being the oldest son. That's part of the culture. And Jacob misses that blessing just by literally minutes. And Jacob and Esau, 
they themselves were very different boys. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 27, it says, As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. So Jacob liked to cook. Esau is a hunter. Uh, and so they're different. Next verse, it says, Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And so the picture here is painted for us of Jacob pretty early on is that Jacob really could have never taken on Esau in a wrestling match. I mean, Esau was the tough outdoorsman. However, Jacob was a manipulator. He is this passive-aggressive dude who really had a way of manipulating people and situations to his advantage. In fact, even the name Jacob at that time meant deceiver or conniver or coercer or grabber, like heel grabber. And because Esau was the oldest, he's got the birthright. And with that birthright goes the blessing. So here's Jacob. He grows up in a home and he's hearing all about God's blessing to his grandfather Abraham. Uh, God's blessing then is passed on to his father Isaac. And now it's going to be passed on to his older brother Esau. So at this point, Isaac is getting old. He's going blind. And so Jacob, with the help of his mother Rebekah, presents himself to Isaac as Esau in order to get the blessing. He even puts goat hair on his arm so he'll be as hairy as his older brother and he tricks his dad into getting the blessing. Now, when his dad Isaac realizes what Jacob did and how he had deceived him, his dad said to Esau, the older brother, and we find this in Genesis 27 beginning in verse 35, your older brother was here or your brother was here and he tricked me. He's taken away your birthright. Esau exclaimed, no wonder his name is Jacob, for now he has cheated me twice. First he took my rights as the firstborn, and now he has stolen my blessing. Now, Jacob knows Esau, and he knows that his older brother is not going to let this go, and he knows that his life is in danger. So what does he do? Well, he doesn't confront the situation. He doesn't go to Esau and have the difficult conversation and try to work things out. He doesn't humble himself and own it and say, yeah, you're right. I, I tricked dad into giving me the blessing. Instead, what he does is he runs away. He runs away from the devastation of that moment. And he ends up living far away with his uncle Laban. And he works with Laban, and while he's working there, he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. And he agrees to work for seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. But here's the thing. Laban is a little bit like Jacob. And Jacob gives, uh, gets a taste of his own medicine by his uncle Laban. Laban tricks Jacob into marrying his older daughter, Laban's older daughter, Leah. Now, he doesn't realize he's married to Leah. It was dark. Uh, there was probably alcohol involved. He wakes up the next day after the wedding, and here's what the Bible, it just puts it really simply. It just says, in the morning, there was Leah. That's all it says. And that's what happens. So, he, he works out then with his uncle Laban to work another seven years if he can marry Rachel as well. And in total, he ends up working 20 years for Laban. And during this time, Laban and Jacob have all kinds of tension. But here's the thing, Jacob never deals with it. He never confronts it. He never has the tough conversation. In fact, we read that uh, Laban changed Jacob's wages on 10 different occasions, and he cheated him out of money. But Jacob found ways to manipulate the situation. He becomes passive aggressive because that's what he does. He begins to build wealth. He, he builds up his own herd of livestock and he comes up with a scheme to take a, a half of Laban's, in fact, the best of Laban's livestock for himself. And then once again, after this happens, when he realizes that that's gonna catch up with him and Laban's gonna catch up with him and he sees kind of everything coming to a head, what does Jacob do? He runs away. 
in the middle of the night. He loads up his wife, his kids, his livestock, his possession, and he runs away. And by the time his uncle finds out, Jacob's got a three-day lead on him. In Genesis chapter 31 and verse 23, uh, it tells us that Laban caught up with Jacob and then God instructed Laban, look, you can't hurt him. But Laban intends to have some words with Jacob anyways. And so in, in chapter 31 in Genesis there of verse 31, Jacob then explains to Laban what happened and he says, well, I, I rushed away. I ran away. Why? Because I was scared. Yeah, that's what he does, see. That's what, that's what Jacob does. He, he runs away. He gets scared. He doesn't fight for things. He doesn't have the difficult conversation. He doesn't face his problems head on. He doesn't look Laban eye to eye. No, he just, he just runs away. And, and, and really, this is kind of the definition of how he lives life. It's like the cycle of his life. And you know what? This is the cycle for many men in their lives. They, they manipulate, they control, they, they try to fix until they can't fix. And when they can't, many times many of them disappear and they withdraw. That's what Jacob did. Well, Jacob and Laban, they, they settled their dispute. And essentially, they, they create this border with some standing stones there as a monument. And Laban is basically saying, hey, don't come back across this border. I'm going to stay over here. You stay over there. Don't, don't come towards my house or we're probably going to have some problems. So Jacob leaves Laban and he continues to head west towards his homeland. Now you got to remember who's in his homeland. Well, Esau, his older brother is there. Esau lives in the homeland. And he hasn't seen Esau, Jacob hasn't, since he cheated him out of everything. He, he doesn't know what's going to go on. He has no idea how Esau is going to receive him. And so Jacob sends some messengers ahead with some gifts for Esau hoping to kind of smooth things out. And the messengers, they go to see Esau, but then they come back, and then in Genesis 32, 6, they come back, they report to Jacob, and they say, we met your brother Esau, and he's already on his way to meet you. Okay, somehow he found out you were coming, and he's coming to meet you. And he's coming to meet you with an army of 400 men. Not good. Here's what it says about Jacob. It says, Jacob was terrified at the news. So, you understand the situations that he's in, right? He's got Laban behind him, and, you know, what had Jacob said to Laban? Well, I, 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 I was scared. I ran away. Esau is in front of him, and he's coming toward him with 400 men, and it says that he's terrified. I mean, I, I'm terrified. He's coming to get me. So, Jacob has to do what he has to do here. He has to do what he's always done here. He has to try to manipulate the situation and look out for himself. And so what he does is he separates his wives and his children, his possession, his livestock, and he puts them into two different groups. Essentially what he's doing here is he's diversifying. He's, he's trying to minimize loss. And he sends them out. He's going to send them out in two different groups. And he's going to see which one Esau attacks first. And that will give the other group time to escape, and then the other group will join whatever's left of that other group. And so he sends out these two groups, and he stays by himself back in the camp to see what is going to happen. And here is the place that he wrestles with God. He wrestles with a man who's later revealed to be the angel of the Lord. And we pick it up in Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 24. It says, This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip, and he wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It's a turning point. I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to quit at this. I'm staying here. I I'm going to struggle through this. I am not going to let you go until you bless me. Genesis 32, pick it up in verse 27. The man asked, what's your name? And he replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. 
From now on, you'll be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. So, Jacob wrestles with God. Now, when you see the angel of the Lord referred to in the Old Testament, this is oftentimes a reference to Jesus making an appearance in the Old Testament. And so, Jacob at first, I mean, he doesn't realize this, and and he doesn't realize what's going on, and this man comes up and he tackles him, you know. I mean, I don't know how this happened. A lot could go into explaining that, but he wrestles with this man, and it turns out to be God, an angel of the Lord, and Jacob comes out on the other side of this as Israel, and he comes out as blessed. So here's a couple lessons for us today that I want us to take home. It's this. One is that he wrestles with God when he is desperate and alone. Okay, so he's got some business to do with God. The truth is, is he's had some business to do with God. It's long overdue. He, he's been running from God for a long time, and now there's nowhere left to turn. And it said there in the beginning of that passage in verse 24 that Jacob, he was all alone. Okay, He was all alone in camp. And my guess is that Jacob didn't do all alone very well at all, or very often. We, we already know about him, you know, as you read through his story, his narrative, that he was a workaholic. He grew up wanting desperately to be the, the blessing of his father. He wanted that, but he didn't get it. It, it went to his older brother. So he's going to spend the rest of his life trying to earn that blessing. He's going to spend the rest of his life trying to prove his father wrong, that, that he deserved it in the first place. And you know what? A lot of men handle their desperation this way. They, they just think, well, you know, if I, look, if I work a little bit harder, um, if I become a little bit more successful... If I can just find my identity over here, then I'll have value, then I'll have worth. Many of us do that. And he worked a lot. I mean, this guy had wives, he had a bunch of children, he had all kinds of servants. His life was surrounded by busyness. He was never by himself. He was never without a task list. Always something to do. Always someone that needed something from him. And in a world, and I suspect that the number has gone up, you know, while we're all quarantined, in a world on average where we check our phones about 221 times a day, all alone is not something that most of us do very well. We surround ourselves with distraction and busyness. But I think if you'll just be quiet long enough, if you can just sit still long enough, you might find that Jesus will tackle you. And it's time to do some business with God. If you can just clear your head for long enough, you know, stop looking at your watch long enough, stop thinking about what's for lunch long enough, stop downloading the apps long enough, you might discover that he's got some business to do with you. And, and I think for Jacob, you know, after he'd sent everybody out of the camp and he's waiting there in the camp, I, I think that probably for him, this was the first time in a long time that he was just all alone, he's by himself, and he has some things with God that need to be addressed. And until those things can be addressed, it's going to be difficult for him to receive that blessing. And I think that's true for many of us. You know, we ask for God's blessing, perhaps in a certain area of our life, but the truth is, is there are some things with him that need to be addressed. And we don't want to address them because perhaps they're painful or it's hurtful and it's a struggle. It's a, it's a wrestling match. So we ask for God's blessing. We want God's blessing. But there's business that needs to be taken care of and, and things that need to be addressed in our lives. And, you know, I, I think we recognize the need to do this with people in our lives, to do some business with people sometimes that we share life with. We, we know certain things. We've got to deal with them. You can't just pretend like they didn't happen all the time. But I think... Sometimes we miss this in our relationship with God. You know, days go by, weeks go by, months go by, years go by, and then all of a sudden, why is it that we feel so distant from God? We don't understand. I mean, we prayed for God's blessing, but it seems like He's neither hearing nor does He care. Maybe you've got some business to do with Him. You know, just get alone with Him long enough to address some of these things. I think this is a huge thing for Jacob. He finds himself alone in the camp and, and an angel of the Lord Jesus shows up. 
Here's another thing we discover, and, and he does this. He, he wrestles with God. Jacob wrestles with God when there's nowhere to run. You know, desperation usually sets in when we run out of options, when those options have been exhausted. And, you know, a common denominator for many people who turn to God is, frankly, they have nowhere else to turn. And that's a good thing. Jerry Sitzer, who wrote the book, A Grace Disguised, he wrote that book uh, describing his life after he'd been in a car accident, where in that car accident, he was hit by a drunk driver. He came out completely unscathed, but in that car accident, he lost three generations of women in his life, his, his mother, his wife, and his young daughter. And in his book, he talks about a grace and this gift of desperation and that God's grace showed up but it sure didn't come the way he thought it would. And he says this, quote, the quickest way for anyone to reach the sun and the light of day is not to run west chasing after the sunset, but rather to head east plunging into the darkness until one comes to the sunrise. We think instinctively, you know, we see the darkness setting, we see the darkness coming, and we run away from it. We head west. We get away from the darkness, and we run, and we run, and we run, and we're trying to outrun some of the consequences, trying to outrun some of the relationships. We just run away, but we're just chasing after something we'll never catch. But what if the fastest way to the sun is to plunge into the darkness and head east? And essentially, you know, that's what we read here about Jacob's life. I mean, he couldn't run anymore. He doesn't run from the angel of the Lord this time. He doesn't flee. He fights through the darkness. And he doesn't give up fighting until he gets to the blessing. You know, a couple things come out of this wrestling match with God. Number one is Jacob is blessed. I mean, it's kind of interesting as you read the life of Jacob is, you know, you, you discover he would pray, but... But when he would pray prior to this, he would always pray to the God of his father Abraham Abraham, and his father Isaac. It was kind of like his experience with God was based on his heritage, kind of passed down to him, but really more theirs than his. But in this desperate moment, he experiences God. He encounters God. He, he meets Jesus personally. Um, and he gets his name changed. In verse 28, it says, You will no longer be called Jacob, but you will be called Israel. And, and then he's blessed, and he, and he receives this blessing. I mean, his whole life he had wanted this blessing. I mean, from the time he was born, he wanted this blessing. But it was his brothers, and he tried to cheat it. He tried to passive-aggressive his way into it. But, but he didn't get his blessing from his father. I mean, he really wanted it from his father. He, it never came until he cheated it. He wanted a blessing from Laban, and it didn't happen. He tried to work hard and hard and try to prove himself. It didn't come. And finally, he gets the blessing from God. And so the question is, okay, what did he do differently this time to receive the blessing? Simply this. He stopped running, and he fought for it. I mean, all he did, really all he did through this wrestling match was... It wasn't like he was pinning God to the ground. All he really did is he was desperately hanging on to God and refusing to let go. That's really all he did. In fact, that's really the only move he had. I'm just going to hang on here and not let go. But I got to tell you something, that's not a bad move if you're wrestling with God. You hang on and you don't let go. And here's what I just say to you today, you know, God doesn't want you to be the same as you were before the addiction, or before the abuse, or before the affair, or before the breakup, or before the financial devastation, or before the pandemic, or before the diagnosis, or before the divorce. He doesn't want you to be the same as you were before the death of a loved one. He wants you to lean heavily on him to hang on to him and as you do he's got some gifts for you that'll surprise you you refuse to let go you fight for it 
and you'll be blessed. You know, another thing we see here, this point forward in Jacob's life, is that he walks with a limp. You know, when you're reading about him wrestling with God, I wonder, and are you wondering, you know, how could he possibly, you know, wrestle with the Lord and, and, and hold on here? I mean, how could he possibly do that? How can he possibly win that match? You kind of get a glimpse of it when you look at verse 25. It tells us kind of maybe the effort that the Lord was putting on. It says in verse 25 that the angel of the Lord touched his hip. And the word touch is really just the word lightly taps. It's like tapping somebody on the shoulder when you don't want to surprise them. Just barely taps. He touches Jacob's hip and it wrenches it out of socket. Incredible pain. It would leave him with a limp for the rest of his life. That's kind of the odd thing about wrestling with God. He may come out of it with a limp. He's come out of it with a blessing. So Jacob wrestles with God and he comes out of it both blessed and broken. He, he's got this limp to live with for the rest of his life. But that limp is a reminder every day of the blessing that God has given him. He's got the scars, but those scars tell the story of a struggle and a blessing. The struggle was difficult. It left him limping. It was painful. It hurt. I, he wasn't sure. He probably couldn't have gone another round if he had to. But there was that blessing. But I also imagine, you know, I imagine, I, I just really believe Jacob had a pretty good story to go with this. I mean, we're reading about it now. I bet he shared it often. And you can almost picture how this might have gone down. You know, he comes back and people may have noticed he's limping. Jacob, what happened? <laughs> You're limping. What happened? Well, first of all, it's not Jacob. It's, it's Israel. Secondly, uh, there was this wrestling match with God that took place. And i got to believe people loved hearing that story. You know, there's something pretty compelling about someone who tells a story about the time that they wrestle with God. And for some of you today, that needs to be a story you tell. Maybe you've been running. Perhaps you've been manipulating. Perhaps you've been passive-aggressive. Trying to control situations, trying to control people, and it's all kind of catching up to you. And I mean, you can keep running. You can put God off. You can decide today, I'm going to keep running in that direction and, and I'm not going to turn around to Him. Or you can do some business with God. And I'm not saying it won't be painful. It will be. I'm not saying you will not have a limp. Probably will. But you'll also receive a gift and he'll bless you. Let's pray together. Father, I would ask that you would just help us to recognize the desperation of the situation. That you would teach us in this moment now to cry out to you. Lord, in this moment where things are so different, that we need your help and we would cry out to you in humility. Thank you for Jesus who allows us to come to you in our time of need. We come to you in our weakness and we ask that you would give us strength, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. dark tried to hide you steal you away death tried to keep you inside of the grave the enemy fought you he tried but he lost you cannot stars When we cried for freedom You tore down the walls The weight of our burden You carried it all Our fears and our faith 
failures painted on the cross You cannot be stopped Move on the mountains Break of chains Jesus has triumphed Over the grave Sing hallelujah The battle is won Nothing can stand Against our God Stand on your victory, we shout out your praise. Miracle maker, you're mighty to save. Awesome in power, relentless in love. You cannot be stopped. Move the mountains, break the chains. Jesus is triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. There's nothing that can stop our God there's nothing that can stop our God there's nothing that can stop our God there is nothing there's nothing that can stop our God there's nothing that can stop our God there's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. Move the mountains, break the chains. Jesus is triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. The battle is won. Nothing can stand. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. God bless all you. Have a great week. Be sure that you watch our Staying Connected videos during the week to find out all the things that are going on in the church. Bring your donations for the group homes. God bless you. We will see you again next Sunday.